Good evening and welcome home to Grace Avenue United Methodist Church. It's wonderful that you have decided to join us for the third installment of Gospel Talk Live. My name is Billy Eccles Richter and I have the joy of being one of the pastors here at the church. And again tonight I'm joined uh, by my colleagues Laura Eccles Richter, the executive pastor of the church, and Laurie Hanson Roberts, the minister of sanctuary worship here at Grace Avenue. And we're also joined by two very important people that support us tonight and help us tonight, uh, and that is Bill Roberts, who is here to host the chat and to field your questions. And so I want to remind you tonight that I hope that you will use the chat feature uh, to write a question or to make a comment, and Bill will relay that to us. Uh, throughout the evening. And then I also want to say a word of appreciation to Preston Reed, uh, our uh, video and media coordinator, uh, who is here once again this week making everything run good and look good and sound good. So Bill and Preston, thank you for your help again this week. Well, we're studying tonight the Gospel of Mark. And uh, I guess in good Gospel of Mark fashion, we ought to just jump right into it because that's what Mark does. He just jumps right into it. I was looking back again uh, uh, in the last couple of days. It's just amazing that, you know, Mark jumps into the gospel and we meet John and uh, Jesus is introduced and then Jesus is baptized and then Jesus is tempted in the wilderness and then uh, Jesus announces the kingdom of God is coming and calls his first disciples. All of that happens in the first 20 verses of Mark. And so when Mark says immediately, uh, we need to take him seriously because he's, he's going he's gonna to give us some pace to all of this. Uh, Sunday, I uh, made the declaration that if you've ever, uh, you know, sped up your narration on your books on tape, well, I have somebody in my family that corrected me and said, Dad, you know, really, it's an audio book. It's not a book on tape. It's an audio book. Well, same thing. If you've ever sped up your narration of your audio book, that's kind of what the gospel of Mark is like. It's fast paced. It moves very quickly. And we move from one thing to another. But in that, there is such a great richness in what is the shortest of the gospels uh, and what we believe to be the first uh, of the gospels written in the New Testament. Uh, but it is very, very rich. So let's start the way we've started the last couple of weeks. Let's just start with that uh, sort of uh, first dive into Mark and say, you know, what is it in Mark? What, what is the story? What is uh, the teaching in Mark that you just really resonate with or love? Laura, you want to start us tonight? I think I mean, what you, you mentioned it actually in your sermon on Sunday, and then you said it again about the, the use of the word immediately. And I counted, and it's actually 39 times. Wow, 39. <laughs> 39 times that he uses immediately. And I think that, you know, Jesus was constantly on the move, constantly moving. And so, maybe, you know, Jesus lived a short 33 years. And so, you know, places to go, people to see. And what I notice in Mark is that... Um, certainly not the the flowery language and i mean it's just okay just the facts ma'am just the facts and you know, we're <laughs> we're moving um but i think um action is so important and urgency is so important in the gospel of mark and um i i noticed that and just um and I don't know if I like this about the Gospel of Mark or if it's just something that I noticed, but there's there's not a lot of connection. You know, they, it just moves from one story to the another and almost sometimes seems a little disjointed. Um, and again, I don't know if I like that about it, <laughs> but um, just something that I noticed. Yeah. Our overall views of the Gospel of Mark. Overall views? No, or overall do you want views. my No, I want favorite. your overall views. So my overall view is... Um, it's tempered by what I learned in disciple Bible study as I've taught that, but also as I went through that. And um, the scholar who leads the video discussion about that always talks about how Mark really was written as a sermon. I mean, it really was written as, an, as a narrative to people gathered. And so when you read it, 
there is that sense in which um, there's a richness about reading it with other people. And, um, and that the story, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, but there's that element in the story that um, it ended one way and then they offer another ending. And it's one of those where, because we really are the people to complete the story. And so there is this, there's a sermon aspect to it. And so when I read um, Mark's gospel, and because I preach also, there is a sense in which I'm invited to say, how can I share that good news in that way? How can I invite people in that way to engage with the story of Christ as powerfully as Mark does, with a sense of urgency, with that sense of um, anticipation, and that sense that Jesus is constantly inviting us to something. And that constant invitation is to repent and to know that the kingdom of God is here. Um, it's, it is right with you. And how are you going to repent and really change your heart, open your heart um, to really receive that and then spread that to others? Yeah, I, I think it is, uh, you know, oftentimes we use the uh, phrase that um, we are the hands and feet of Christ. Mm -hmm. But Mark, I think, would also uh, probably also encourage us to know that in the world today, we are the voice of Christ. Yes. And uh, we are the ones that complete the sermon. Uh, we are the ones that from the open-endedness of an empty tomb where the women run away afraid, mm -hmm. uh, really that's an invitation for us to say, okay, we've got to step into that place and be the witnesses and bear witness to Christ in the world. Uh, my thought about the Gospel of Mark is somewhat similar, um, but it, 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 it is right at the start. Uh, Mark says this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think that is such an interesting uh, contrast with Luke, who says at the beginning he's going to put out an orderly account. Uh, and then we get, you know, that very um, beautiful uh, but sort of drawn out story of Jesus' birth, right? With uh, uh, John the Baptist's parents and then Jesus' parents and then the story about uh, none of that in Mark. And what Mark says is this is the beginning. And the idea here is, is that he's not looking uh, to try to tell the whole story. He's trying to tell the story in such a way that people will believe that Jesus is the Christ. And what is begun in this gospel uh, then is uh, completed by the work uh, of what we now call the church. And uh, uh, certainly uh, Mark, who sometimes known as John Mark, knew and understood that because he was part of that early church movement that took the gospel into the Gentile world. And uh, he was one of the early Christian missionaries who traveled with Paul, traveled with Barnabas, and traveled with uh, Peter as well. So, yeah, so these are, these are great ways to kind of look at an overview of the gospel of Mark and kind of how it touches us. Let's be more specific now. What, what's a story in Mark that sort of stands out for you? Laura? I'm, I'm going to let Laura Okay, Laura. Okay. Okay. Um, well, this, this appears in both the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke as well, but the, the parable of the sower, mm -hmm. the sower in, that goes in. I, <laughs> I have a very vivid memory of this in Sunday school when I was a child of the Sunday school teacher telling this story. But, you know, the, the seed falls on hard ground. And I think the seed is the Word of God, and then wherever the seed lands is a, a metaphor for our hearts. Mm -hmm. So the seed can fall on the hard ground, you know, birds come and eat it, and then the seeds fall on the shallow ground, and, you know, it will take root just for a bit and then wither and dry away. And then the seed can fall on crowded ground where there are so many other things, you know, vying for your attention. And in, in the gospel, it says the weeds come up and choke it out, and then the plant dies away, and then fruitful ground. Finally, ground that is fertile, ground that is receptive. And I think we all have, um, our hearts can be any of those things at any time. You know, it's not just one way, always, forevermore. I think, you know, I've certainly had times when I've had a hard heart. I've ha had times when I've had all of those. Um, but just the, the thought of God's seed growing in my heart so then I can go and share that with the world. Yeah, and the wonderful idea that... Uh you know, that it produces in the good soil a harvest that's not just one-to-one, -one, right? Right. I mean, that's the amazing thing about seed is that it, it produces harvest of 30, 60, and 100-fold. And, right. you know, when we are, are receptive to God in our lives, it is amazing the fruit that God 
bears that, that comes forth from all of that. And uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an important uh, story. Uh, it, I, I love it too because it, it is a reminder that in that day and time, they didn't necessarily sow seeds like we do, like y'all do in the community garden with this very, you know, uh, sort of organized, but there is this sort of just random scattering of the seed in uh, hopes that it will find uh, its way into good soil. And uh, sometimes, it, sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And I love your idea that um, really all four of those soils exist in my life. It's not like I'm one kind of soil and you're another kind of soil, and you're not, but it's the, all four of those soils are in my own life. And that's why I have to continue to nurture, just like you, you know, we, we think about uh, farmers today, they, they do things to enrich their soil. And that's what we do whenever we uh, do follow uh, uh, and study and practice our faith and attend to the means of grace. It's what we're doing right now. That's right. It's what we're doing <laughs> doing right now. So uh, we're, we're tilling the soil and making it better. What about you? Well, so it's one of those where, as Laurie talked about, um, so much of Mark's gospel is found in both Luke and Matthew. Yeah. In fact, 600 of the six. 161 verses in Mark are found in Matthew. And so it's amazing how much is, um, we would almost say that it's almost like, you know, if you had copy and paste, you would just copy Mark and put it over. But didn't they originally, they didn't know or think that Mark was the first gospel because so much was taken. And so it's one of those where it's amazing because you have this, when you think about the fact that there weren't computers. There, I mean, we think about this and we think, oh, they must have just stayed. No, I mean, that was about how the stories were told and retold and the oral tradition and how that was passed on. And so it's just sort of amazing to think about how all of that came to be. Um, with that, the story of the sower, and I'm going to give two stories, but um, Mark 4, 26, is another seed story. Um, but it's not found in the other Gospels. And so it's sort of interesting. It says, then Jesus said, this is what God's kingdom is like. It's as though someone scatters seed on the ground and then sleeps and wakes night and day. The seed sprouts and grows, but the farmer doesn't know how. The earth produces crop all by itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full head of grain. And whenever the crop is ready, the farmer goes out to cut the grain because it's harvest time. And... I think about that with this, that whole parable of the sower, and yet there's this other image that Jesus lifts up and talks about the fact that oftentimes that seed that's planted, we're not even sure how it's continuing to grow within, and yet fruit can come from it um, if we remain open, if we're not, don't have those hardened hearts. So um, anyway, that's just one of those verses. The other story that I love that's in Mark's gospel that's not in the other gospels is um, a healing story. And it's a healing story found in Mark 8. And it's not very long, so I'm going to read it to you because I love this. It's Jesus and his disciples came to Bethsaida. And some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch and heal him. Taking the blind man's hand, Jesus led him out of the village. And after spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on the man, he asked, Do you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees. Only they're walking around. And then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again. And he looked with his eyes wide open. His sight was restored, and he could see everything clearly. And then Jesus sent him home saying, don't go into the village. And I'm fascinated by that story because Jesus, the first time, the healing doesn't take. I mean, this sort of this whole image of Jesus even looking at the man saying, do you, do you see everything clearly? And the, no, well, I kind of, but it's sort of like people, but they look like trees walking around, which I'm fascinated because the man could describe it that way. And Billy has often described for me his image of not being able to see leaves on the trees when he didn't have clear vision. And then there's that image of Jesus touching him again, offering healing again. And there's, it says the eye, the man's eyes were wide open. He looked with his eyes wide open. And I think how often we walk around without our eyes wide open. 
and what it means for us to then really allow Christ to help us see clearly. That we think we sort of see, but if we really allow that seed to continue to be planted in us and to continue to let it grow, what happens when we really, when we really allow ourselves to have our eyes wide open? And so I just love that story because one, it sort of raises that question, Jesus heals him twice. I mean, did Jesus not get it right the first time? But it's one of those where I think it's so much more about the man and about how we allow Christ to enter into our lives. So, Well, there are a lot of healing stories in the Gospel of Mark, uh, maybe as many or more than any other gospel. And uh, part of what's interesting about those stories, of course, is that, uh, we'll talk about this in a minute, the, this idea of the secrecy motif, that oftentimes when Jesus healed someone or when Jesus drove out demons, he either told the cured person or he oftentimes told the demons, don't tell anybody. Um, and so the, the public nature of that, and yet they couldn't really hold it back. Uh, there are often times in which they say that popularity of what Jesus was doing. One of those is one of my favorite stories in the gospel market. It happens really early on in chapter two, and it's the story of the healing of the paralytic. But what I, I love about this story is how they got uh, the, the paralyzed man to Jesus. So the uh, story is, is that Jesus is teaching. He's in this house in Capernaum. It's totally crowded. The doorway is so packed you can't get through. And there are four friends that want Jesus to heal their friend. And so they carry him. And when they get to the house and realize they can't get to Jesus, they take this man up on the roof, cut a hole in the roof, pull the thatch or whatever off the roof, and they lower this man to where Jesus is. And in that moment, there's also Pharisees and other religious teachers around him. And Jesus sees him coming down through the roof, basically on this kind of, I guess, rope system. As he's lowered down, Jesus says to the man, your sins are forgiven. And, of course, that just sets off the religious leaders. He can't just say that this man's sins are forgiven. Who is he to forgive sins? And yet, as he gets down, Jesus says, which is easier? To say this man to this man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, take up your mat and walk, but so that you'll know that you know the power of God is among us. I say to you, get up, uh, take your pallet and walk. And he gets up and he's healed. He's no longer paralyzed. But it, I love that story because it's just so picturesque to me. I, it's just one of those things, and and I like it in some respects. I like it because of the chaos that is caused, right? Uh, there is this picture of Jesus teaching and everybody's having a good time and isn't it wonderful? And then the disruption of the hole being torn in the roof and the man being lowered. I, I just think that uh, sometimes in our lives, uh, it is the holy disruption mm -hmm. uh, that is the things that we need to pay attention to. Sometimes there's in, been interruptions in our life, much much like there's been this year. And our first reaction is, oh, I had everything set up the way I wanted it. It was just perfect the way it was. And now the roof's fallen down. And in that moment, I think, you know, it's it, one of the most important things we can do by faith is to ask the question, in the midst of this disruption, where is God still at work? How is God still at work? And, and what am I trying to, uh, to be shown in this moment? And the healing of the man is a, is a wonderful thing. Uh, Laura has an interesting painting of this story in her office. And uh, you see the man being uh, lowered. And I love the caption of the painting. The painting is called, My Friends Let Me Down. And it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful expression of all that. But uh, to me, that's the story I think that resonates most out of the Gospel of Mark. And really, it's, it's, it's pretty early on. Uh, let's talk for a minute about this secrecy motif. I'm curious to, to know what y'all think about that. that uh, again, uh, we get uh, uh, these sort of repetitive things, the word immediately, the word on the way. But we get this thing over and over again about Jesus uh, saying to people, don't don't tell anybody that I'm the Messiah. Don't tell anybody what you know about me. I wonder uh, if we might take a few minutes and just talk about that, because obviously that's something that's important in the Gospel of Mark. Yeah, it happens all, all through. And I think it's Jesus trying to take the, the focus and attention off of himself and place the, the attention on God, that God is working through me. This is not my power. It is the power of God through me. And a step further, it can be the power of God through you. So, yeah. yeah. Why? So 
I'm always fascinated because I feel like that Jesus was, again, that seed element throughout it is that Jesus continued to plant seeds and knew that it was going to take time for that fruit to come about, for people to be able to open their hearts to him, for people. And so there's that ongoing of, I think, him sort of living into that, it's not my time yet. The kingdom of God is near. Um, it's not quite time yet. And so rather than go spread all of this, begin to feel that seed that's planted within you. Allow that to grow. Allow that to begin to flourish. And so there is that quietness. Now, the very moment that Jesus then tells, I mean, the good news is proclaimed through the resurrection and they're not supposed to be quiet anymore. The women have the opportunity to run and share the good news that Christ has risen. That's when they're afraid. That's when, so early on there's that, shh, don't tell anybody. And it's almost like the joy rises up and they can't help but to say it. And then the moment where no, this is the moment. Go and share the good news. They let fear overwhelm them, and they're not able to go and share. And so it's one of those where there's this interesting balance of when do we share the good news? And that encouragement is at the end of the story of the gospel is for us to continue the story, that now we can tell. Now we can. Now is the time. So... I think for me, it's a matter that Mark wants to really be careful about the identity of Jesus. Uh, that Mark wants to say that Jesus is the Christ, he is the Messiah, he is the Savior of the world. And so to that end, over and over again, he doesn't, as, as many uh, wonderful things as Jesus does, he doesn't want Jesus simply to be known as a prophet. He doesn't want Jesus simply to be seen as a miracle worker. And, you know, I think that's, a, that's an interesting thing in terms of how we relate to Christ because so oftentimes we want Christ to be the miracle worker in our lives. I want Jesus to do miracles in my life. Jesus, I've got problems. I've got needs. I pray, Jesus, take this away. Jesus, let this happen. But there are also moments, in, in, and it happens in the Gospel of Mark, where Jesus says... You need to take up, you want to be my disciple, you got to take up your cross and follow me. And um, we need to oftentimes think about what is it to proclaim that Jesus is the Christ. And that is to say that Jesus isn't just uh, the miracle worker in our lives. He is, he is literally the Savior of the world. And sometimes that has an even uh, greater requirement for us about how we live our lives and and, and uh, how we respond to him as the Christ. And, and for me, I think that's a lot about what the secrecy is about. It, uh, Jesus kept wanting to say, You're not, I'm not revealed the way uh, you are seeing me in this moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a greater depth to all of that uh, that I think is, is, is important as well. Um, so troubling things, do you guys have things that bother you about the gospel? Mark, Laurie, you already, uh, meant, Laurie, you already mentioned one that uh, you talked about a little bit that uh, is, just seems a little disconcerting. You have other things in the gospel, Mark, that you deal with? Well, and I'll talk just for a minute more about that. I mean, it, it, uh, the short version of the ending of the gospel of Mark is just hard for me because I constantly live into the fact that the women proclaim the good news. The women were the ones who were willing to go and and suddenly now in Mark's gospel the women run away. The women run away. And I'm like, wait, that's not who the women are. That is not and so there is that sense in which I constantly sort of go back to that and go, wait a second, um, that's not what I want to hear. So um, I think we have to own that though, that we live in both of those places where sometimes we find the courage to do that very thing that we might not ever think that we could do. And yet there's also those moments when we struggle to have the courage to do the thing that we need to do. And yet the women ran away. The, the, the words say that they ran away in fear. They ran away in terror. Yes. But they also ran away in amazement. In amazement, yes. So it's, you know, before we get too hard on the women here. That's right. That, that they, they did, sometimes... I don't, when you see something that is so amazing, you're at a loss as to know what mm -hmm. to do or, or a loss for words. Yeah. But they were the ones that went to the tomb. Yes, yes. that's true. <laughs> that's right. Yes, correct. 
Uh, I'd like to talk for a minute about a story uh, that uh, some people find troubling and yet some people find very revealing, which is in the seventh chapter of uh, the Gospel of Mark uh, at the 24th verse, which is oftentimes referred to as the story of the Syrophoenician woman. Mm, So the Syrophoenician woman is an interesting uh, account of a woman who is a Gentile who comes to Jesus and uh, since Laura's already opened that door, I'll just do what she did. I'll just read it for a minute. This is 24. It's fairly short. Uh, from there, he set out and went on the way to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. He, Jesus has a lot of this. I don't want you to know who I am. I don't want you to know where I am. Um, but uh, yet he could not escape notice. And a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him. And she came and she bowed down at his feet. Now, the woman was a Gentile of Syro-Phoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And Jesus said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying on the bed, and the demon was gone. It's a beautiful story in many respects, but it's got some difficulty with it. You think the Gentiles were dogs? Well, in this, many people believe that's what Jesus was calling her, and that Jesus was referencing (laughs) that, I mean... He's not going to take the bread from the table. And, I mean, so less than is even that. Um, it isn't right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. And that reference, I mean, in some ways to her. Now, what, as I've read, because I've studied the story some, because it's one of those where you have this woman and Jesus is engaging, and there is a lot of scholarly conversation about it. Um, because... That first part is where Jesus is trying to hide. That's sort of interesting in and of itself that he's, he's snuck into a house and he's trying to hide. But you also then have this whole notion of his engagement with this woman. And so whereas some people talk about the fact that, I mean, it's a racial slur um, in the origin of it, in the way in which he was referring to her and to others, um, And so that is seen as disregarding. There is also a moment in which he engages her in this conversation. And the response from the CEB is good answer. But he actually, um, he engages in dialogue with her, which is not um, appropriate during that time period. And so he's engaging with a woman, he's engaging with a Gentile, he's engaging with, someone of another race. And so all of that, um, it, there's still this dialogue and, and sparring. And so there is some sense in which there is some level of engagement and respect that comes with that. And so there's an interesting dialogue there of the fact that he even engages in the conversation, that he doesn't. Um, so even though what he says seems highly inappropriate there is also that moment of he actually is willing to engage her about the very racial injustice that continues to be and in the midst of that moment the fact that she stands up and says something it's almost like he says you are right to stand up for yourself you are right to rise up and question the way in which others see you or the way in which others treat you. And so suddenly what Jesus does in that moment is not only call attention to the injustice and the ways in which people have referred to people, but also then to say to her, it is right for you to stand up for yourself. So you would say she is a picture of resistance? Mm, Yes. Hmm. Interesting. You want to weigh in on this? Well, I've, I've just always thought it as a story of Jesus showing that everyone has worth. 
Mm-hmm. You know, the fact that she was a woman, the fact that she was a Gentile, and yet he is engaging with her. So I had never really thought about it in a deeper sense like you, like you just stated. Um, it was always just a, a, a feeling of that we all have worth. Mm. So. Yeah. So I, one of the things that I guess I would uh, think about this too is uh, a, a connection to another story that happens. And uh, I love the beauty of, of, of her argument, right? That I don't need a lot. I just need a little bit here. And if, if I can just have a, a little bit, even if I have the, the crumbs of what falls from the table, that will be enough to heal my daughter. That will be enough. You know, that's that believe about mustard seed faith that we often talk about if you just had the faith of a mustard seed. But the other story I parallel that a little bit with in the Gospel of Mark is the story in chapter 5 where... Uh, Jesus is on his way to somewhere else and he's in a crowd and a woman with a, has had a hemorrhage for a number of years, maybe 18 years, something like that. And you remember she, he comes he up and touches, touches the hem mm-hmm. of his garment. She doesn't need a lot. She doesn't have to have a face-to-face encounter. She doesn't have to have you know, him saying the words. She just proclaims that if I could just touch the hem of his garment, uh, it'll be enough. And I think about, you know, for all the things that we don't know in our lives, it's that little amount of faith sometimes that still can produce big results and amazing things that can happen. And uh, I just see that in this story is that Jesus challenges her. And I think the inter- that's a very interesting perspective about resistance and how she stands up for herself. Uh, but then the reality of it is, is it's almost like she's saying, look, I'm not wanting a lot from you. That's right. I'll, I'll take I'll whatever take I get. Yeah, no, I'll take I, a crumb. A crumb. A very, just yeah. the smallest of thing, I believe, will yeah. save my daughter. Yeah. Well, and it, it must have been so crowded. People all around him. And the fact that he felt yeah. her touch in your know, turn. You know, who touched my garment? Who touched me? Yeah. <laughs> who touched me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, because the disciples were like, what? Well, look at all the people. What's, what are you talking about? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a, Which it's, is where the disciples stand a lot in yeah, Mark. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't so, get it, Jesus. Yeah, so we might want to talk about that for just a minute, too. I mean, the disciples don't get it often in Jesus, in, in, in Mark. I mean, they just, bless their hearts, they just don't get it. And that's true of the parables. Oftentimes he tells a parable and they go, huh? And then there's other times when things happen and uh, they, uh, they, they just they don't get it. The, the story of Jesus walking on the water happens right after um, uh, the first feeding, multitude feeding story, the feeding of the five, what we call the feeding of the 5,000. And it's funny because at the end of that story, Jesus has walked on the water and they stand there and they're astonished. And Mark says, because they still didn't understand what really had happened during the feeding. I mean, it's one thing, you know, Jesus now walked to them on water and yet they're still confused about what had happened in the previous story about him feeding the multitude with five loaves and two fish. It's, uh, they have a hard time. And, and the story we read this last Sunday, right, was this same kind of story about Jesus has been teaching them and showing them and all of these kinds of things and actually been telling them he had predicted several times his own death and resurrection. And they get out on the road and decide they're going to argue about which one of them is the greatest. And that... You know, Jesus is, once again, I think, Jesus shakes his head a lot at the disciples during the the gospel. Which is probably why he asked somebody, did it work? Can you see? Because my disciples are not getting this. And and I think about the fact that his engagement with, like, this woman in the story that you just read, the breath of fresh air for him that somebody would say, I only need a crumb. I only, I, I get who you are. Who you are. I just need a crumb. Yeah. Just a crumb. Or I just need a touch. And for him to have that sense that, oh, there's people who are getting this when the very people that I spend most of my time with sometimes don't. And I know that I live into where the disciples are so many times. So Yeah, that's me. I mean, there, there is almost a little bit of reassurance that, okay, if, if the disciples couldn't get it... Um, because there are so many times when I feel like I don't get it. We're in good company. Yeah, we are. <laughs> but then I also think, I mean, just about all of us processing whatever it is, that doubt and questioning and all those, all of that is part of the process to coming, to come to belief. And so it's okay to doubt. 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's okay to question. All right, let's pause for just a second. Billy, have any, are there any questions coming in, comments tonight we need to deal with? Uh, not so far. We're waiting for questions. Uh, back to you, Billy. <laughs> All right, you're bound to have some questions. I know that we have a little bit of a delay, so you might not be quite caught up to where we are. Why don't we talk about the end of the Gospel of Mark? We've mentioned a little bit about the um, um, discussion around the, the resurrection story, which again, you know, I think we love the resurrection stories that once again have that sort of uh, poignant good feel to it, like we love the story of John and he meets Mary in the garden. That's a great story. And the story of doubting Thomas and the story in Luke in which the angel asks, you know, why do you seek the living among the dead? And the story of the Emmaus Road. Well, there's none of that here. I mean, it's just abrupt. They go to the tomb. There is an angel there that says, what's happened is what he told you. And he shows them the place where Jesus had uh, been buried and was laying. And then it's over. And they run away in fear. Um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's challenging in that respect because it doesn't give us kind of that personal feel good. And yet it's, it's very powerful in terms of some of the things that we've talked about. Um, I want to talk, though, just for a minute a little bit about um, part of the ending and the crucifixion. Uh, one of the things that is powerful, I think, in um, the uh, story of the crucifixion is the first person to see it for what it is. And in uh, Mark 15, uh, when Jesus is crucified, um, he actually, uh, it happens, uh, we come to about noontime and darkness comes over the whole land and Jesus um, uh, utters some words from the Psalms. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, And then... um, what happens is uh, some bystanders try to revive him a little bit just to kind of see if he'll call for Elijah. But then uh, Jesus uh, dies. He gives a loud cry in verse 37 and then breathes his last. And in that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two and a centurion who was facing him saw the way he had breathed his last and said, truly, this man was the son of God. Now make of the curtain being torn in two in the declaration of the centurion well I've always loved the, the image of the curtain being torn in two because it's it's that opening that tearing of any walls it's the tearing apart of curtains it's that op- the full opening of any barriers that we may have ever felt between us and God is all wide open now um that curtain separated the Holy of Holies from the people. And so that opening for all of us to be able to have that presence. But with the centurion, then it also extends beyond just um, those who normally would gather in the temple, the chosen, the Israelites, but for everyone. I mean, um, the centurion who is there, the Roman official is there. And suddenly... That curtain is torn and open to cross and open for all people. And not just for our engagement with God, but maybe our engagement with one another. (laughs) Yeah. Um, You know, I think it it, it is interesting. Um, We talked Sunday and have have talked before about, you know, this, the gospel of Mark was written around 70 AD, which is when the temple was destroyed by the Romans. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, there was a rebellion in 66, and the, that all ended by the Romans basically destroying Jerusalem, but more importantly, just destroying the temple. Uh, and it's interesting because for, um, for the Jewish people, right, that was where God resided. I mean, they had a concept of God being in everything and throughout the world, but the, the real presence of God was uh, to be found in the temple in that place, and now it was gone. And in this moment, to say that the temple, the curtain was torn in two, breaks open this whole notion that that God doesn't have to reside there. And in fact, God resides in the person of this one who has died on the cross. And I think the irony that is so beautiful in the story is the first one to proclaim that. Truly, this man was the son of God, was a member 
of the, uh, uh, of the country or the people that had destroyed the temple. Uh, the Romans who had destroyed the temple and now the first one to realize it in the Gospel of Mark, that he was the son of God, was a Roman centurion. And I think it has a lot to say about how we understand our, our uh, adversaries, how we understand our enemies, and how we understand, more importantly, the power of God to reconcile and redeem everything, right? In that moment, it, Mark doesn't end this gospel by basically saying, you know, and the, 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 the Romans are left out. Instead, what Mark says is even the Romans uh, are transformed by this one who is the Son of God. So what other things do y'all want to talk about tonight? You had other stuff you wanted to bring up this evening? Things you want? Well, so another verse that's in Mark's gospel that's not anywhere else is this image of um, the young man in the garden. And um, so it's in chapter 14. And many people believe it is a reference to John Mark himself, that that there is the possibility that... um, the Last Supper may have taken place in um, John Mark's mother's home, or that that may have been where they gathered. And so John Mark may have been supposed to be in bed, but was watching, was uh, observing some of that, or when they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane, that he followed them out that direction. And so it is one of those where, or he may have just written himself in, which sometimes people do, and their own writings as a part of how he well, as we felt learned like last he was week, engaged. John certainly did. Okay. Yes. And so at chapter 14, um, it's right after Judas kisses Jesus. It's verse 45 that says, As soon as he got there, Judas said to Jesus, Rabbi. And then he kissed him, and then they came and grabbed Jesus and arrested him. One of the bystanders drew a sword, a sword and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his ear. And Jesus responded, Have you come with swords and clubs to arrest me like an outlaw? Day after day I was with you teaching in the temple, but you didn't arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And all of his disciples left him and ran away. And then there's this verse. One young man, a disciple, was wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They grabbed him. But he left the linen cloth behind and ran away naked. And so it's one of those where in that moment you have this young man who as Jesus is arrested is stripped and is vulnerable in that moment. Mm. And that feeling that all of us in that moment, um, the disciples have run away and all of us are left somewhat vulnerable in that moment. And... um, so it, there's just that power in that, in that verse and thinking about how all of us are in the midst of those moments where we're uncertain, where we're afraid, where um, things aren't going the way that we expect them to. And the thought that Jesus was going to rise up in power and that it was going to be this violent moment, and yet Jesus says, put away your swords and, and this happens. Yeah. So. And we're, I mean, in that moment, we're very exposed, right? Yeah. I mean, the exposure there, you talk about being vulnerable. The exposure there is, again, this idea of do I follow Jesus just when it's easy? And yeah. do I follow Jesus just when things are good and things are uh, of benefit to me? Or do I follow Jesus in that very difficult moment? Uh, and that, I, you know, I think, Laura, that's a, a really important point that they were expecting um, sort of this political uprising and Mark again writing in that same period where there had been a a violent and uh, a a conflict and an uprising and it it didn't work Uh, yeah in that same chapter I I love the very beginning because it's one of two places where it is notated that Jesus sang oh yeah really yeah (laughs) Yeah, so at the very big uh, beginning or no it's chapter 26 um, when they had sung the hymn they went out to the Mount of Olives and Jesus said to them you will all become deserters for it is written and it goes on but it actually notates that Jesus and the disciples sang and it happens again in Matthew um, and one of our hymns in our United Methodist hymnal uh, when in our music God is glorified Mm -hmm. um, the third verse it actually 
uh, talks about this very, this very verse that Jesus sang a psalm. And just the idea of Jesus singing just warms my heart. Well, and you think about as they went out and they were singing, there was that moment where they were gathered together and the hopes that mm -hmm. they all had. Right. And in that moment, whereas Jesus was sort of dealing with the laments and right. struggle, the disciples were living into, we just had the supper and we celebrated the Passover. And, right. and they were living into that sense of probably joy and satisfaction and, and feeling like things were right. And then everything turns. Things seem to not be right. Yeah. And for, and for this young man to sort of be on the side observing. And it's an, I think it's an invitation for us to be invited into the story, for us to be invited into the song, for us to be invited into the garden, and for us to then be present there. Um, and so, anyway, this, but that's the only place that is mentioned. It's not in any of the other Gospels, and Matthew and Luke do not pick this part up. And so you have to believe that it probably was a reference back to John Mark. And, and I love the fact that then, um, if you move over then to the resurrection story to the empty tomb in chapter 16 um, the same reference of that young man um, is also when you read about um, the first day of the week um, they were talking about who was going to roll the stone away and going to the tomb at verse 5 going into the tomb they saw a young man in a white robe seated on the right side, and they were startled. So it's not an angel. But he said to them, don't be alarmed. And that is the one who proclaims the good news. But it's the same use of the word, the young man who runs away, vulnerable, and now is without clothing, leaves the linen cloth, and now sitting beside the linen cloth, you have this young man who is dressed in white. Mm. And that sense of early Christians, the resurrection, I mean. Same guy. The Easter road. Well, for some, there's sort of that, how are we transformed? How are we transformed as Christians? How are we transformed by the good news? How are we transformed from moving from the Garden of Genesis all the way back to, to the story of Easter? Well, but I, so, I think it, though, brings up that, I mean, Mark, uh, there is something to be said for Mark's writing style. And uh, I think we probably don't give Mark enough credit for how beautifully this is written because it does move so quickly that sometimes you miss these intimate kind of connections like you just made. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that we know that Mark was really one of the first to adopt the style that we now call gospel. Uh, he wasn't writing about Jesus for biography's sake or for historic sake. He was writing for the sake of... Uh, making the point that Jesus is the Son of God. And so the way the stories are collected and arranged and then the symmetry of some of these things like the young man, uh, I think is a reminder that this, you know, Mark is very intentional about trying to get his message, his good news about Jesus Christ uh, into the world. So that's what I have. That's what you got? <laughs> That's what Bill's got. That's what we've all got. Okay? Well, that's what we've got. That's what we've got. Like Mark, we've moved quickly through things tonight and uh, have enjoyed our time together and uh, uh, hope that it's been beneficial to you. We've enjoyed uh, being with you again tonight. We have one more week of Gospel Talk Live. Uh, it will commence uh, next Wednesday at 8.30 when we take a look at the Gospel of Matthew, uh, which uh, 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 has its own um, particularities that we will discuss and hope that you will finish this week reading the Gospel of Mark and then prepare yourself this Sunday to hear a wonderful passage of scripture from Matthew chapter 20 and then be prepared to read the gospel of Matthew next week. It's been wonderful to be with you. I hope that you have a wonderful week. Uh, good night and God bless you.